Hello, thank you. I'm Allie Overton, and I want to talk to you about common problems in game art and how we can solve them. Uh, so this talk is going to cover some game art basics because it's for you, those of you that don't have a lot of experience with game art and are introducing it to your games. We're going to talk about critique, the way we can treat things instinctually, and some ways that we can do it traditional and apply that to practical game critique. Also going to talk about vocabulary, probably terms you've heard, but maybe that you haven't thought about as well as you could have. And so we're gonna go over some examples. So let's start with an example of an example. So you're looking at your game and you're noticing that your character isn't as visible as you would like it to be against the background. What tools do you have at your disposal to make your character more visible? What is your player looking at instead of your character? Things to think about. Well, let's start with critique. Critique is a tool for finding the strengths and weaknesses of an image. So in our instinctive way we critique things is we'll see an image and we'll immediately judge it. You have an opinion the first second you see the picture and then you justify your opinion. You might say something like, mm, this picture's no good because that I think is a cat and that's not a cat's face. Um, so this can be valid. There's plenty of times when this does merit valid feedback, but you might see an image like this one and offer the feedback that it's too blue. And so with that, you or your artist fix it. Bam, it's green, problem solved. Or is it really? Maybe what you meant was there is more colors needed. So it's important to know what you're looking for when you're critiquing an image. So in traditional critique, there's a four-step structure. You start by describing it. This is a literal description of content. You look at an image and you say, there's two people, one of them's holding a pitchfork, they're in front of a building, they're both looking pretty frowny, um, and that sort of thing, very content-based. And then you analyze. If this is a piece of traditional art, you might talk about how it was made with acrylic and what type of tools they made. If it's digital art, you might tell them that it's made in Photoshop and you can tell by the pixels. Um, no matter what type of art it is, you talk about like the way that color is used, the way contrast is used. And then you interpret. This is the sort of thing that people like to joke about when they're critiquing art. They're like, hmm, yes, a splatter painting is fascinating, but what does it mean? Uh, and there is some element of what does it mean to interpreting, but it's more about what did the artist intend. Uh, maybe the splatter painting really was just to get out some anger. Maybe this portrait is a portrait of two people. It's very realistic based on who they are. Or maybe it's a commentary on small town life. What do you think the intention of the artist was? And then now that you've collected all of this information, you can judge. You know how it was made. You have an inkling of why it was made. And so you can determine if it was effective. So in that portraits, was it an accurate portrait in the splatter painting? Do you think the artist feels better now? Like, so how does this apply to practical critique for game art? Well, there's one key difference, but most of the fundamentals are the same. And that difference is that you get to define your own goals. This is your game. You know what you want to do with your art. You know what sort of thing you're trying to get across. There's a few goals that are very common in game art. One of them is portraying information. You often want your player to be able to tell at a glance where danger is. You might want to get control their focus. Similar to information, you want them to look at something in particular, a face, a dialogue. It's very hard to get players to actually look at dialogue. And then there's emotion. Some games, this doesn't really affect them too much, but there's very genre-based games like horror and others that trying to get across emotion with your art is very important to them. And then style. Style can be a variable thing. Maybe you are a solo programmer and your style is going to be minimalist and simple because that's within your skill level. Or maybe you're working with an artist who's incredibly talented and you want to show them off. Maybe marketing is a goal of yours and you want art that supports marketing and might go viral on Twitter. Whatever your goals are, now that you know them and you've established them, and they can vary from these and include these and others, you can determine the effectiveness of your visuals. So in Vs, they make their information very clear using bright colors and interesting shapes so that you can immediately read that something is dangerous. 
In Dream Daddy, they use detail and color and our natural inclination to look at faces to draw your eye to the character, as well as a really large text box to make people actually look at the text. And then in Limbo, they have interesting silhouettes and desaturated colors that make you feel the spookiness factor even more. And in Bastion, they intentionally have a more elaborate style that is very memorable and interesting, but not necessarily a requirement for their gameplay. So with that, what, where is this image succeeding? What can we change about it? And what tools do we have to improve it? Well, art vocabulary, this is how we talk about the tools that we have to influence our visuals. And there's a bunch of common ones. So let's start with color. You've probably heard of it. So it, when we talk about color, we might say that something is blue and we want it to be a blue thing. But blue could be blue or blue or blue. So it's proper to be more specific. It's much more helpful. So we usually talk about value because value is one of the brain ways we can make contrast in a visual. Value is the light and dark in an image, the gradient from brightest white to darkest black. And set hue is next. It's ignoring saturation and value. Hue is basically color as we learned as a kid. It's the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. And then saturation is how gray or vibrant something is. This is regardless of hue and value. Some people think saturation is also influenced by value, but they're completely separate from each other. So contrast can be between any of these elements. Value contrast, like I said, is one of the most effective ones, but it can also be a contrast of hues or a contrast of saturation. Chess is an example of contrast of value. It's the lightest white versus the darkest black. Checkers is an example of contrast of saturation very red, very vibrant versus desaturated black. And Chinese checkers is a contrast of hues where you have only differentiation between hues and not in value or saturation. So when we talk about color, it's important to try and talk about all of these elements individually. It's more valuable to say I want a light bright sky than it is to say I want a blue sky on its own. So composition, there's a whole lot of elements to composition in art, but one of the ones that applies to gameplay the most is density. High density visuals are chaotic, busy, and noisy. Density is basically just how much stuff on the is there on the screen. So if there's a bunch of stuff, there's a bunch of stuff you gotta pay attention to. They can make your visuals feel more closed in. They can make you feel frantic, but they can also make your player space seem more alive and vivid and full. And density can be either in the amount of content or in the detail of the content. So in Enter the Gungeon, the amount of content they have, because it's a bullet hell, inherently is a more high density visual. They try to lower the density of the visuals in the background to make it more clear. In Bastion, they actually increase the density of the visuals to make it a more full and immersive environment to add more detail to the art style. Low density is the opposite. It's open, it's minimal, it's airy. It's easy to follow your eye through the space and see things clearly. Uh, it can also have the risk of looking unfinished or unpolished, uh, especially if you're doing a very minimal game. Thomas was alone, it was a very minimal game that avoids this, con this problem because it uses texture and lighting to fill in the lack of density that the gameplay offers. On the other hand, the mortician's shell is uh, fairly dense in terms of interactability on the screen, whereas it's lower in detail, which allows you to see what's going on more clearly. And then there's style. Style, we often talk about stylized versus realistic. But we also end up talking about cartoony. And cartoony is a bit of a trap word. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So it's important to be more specific, break things down into their elements. So talking about color again, you might have very saturated colors, and these are really good for giving moods in a scene. The long dark offers a much more of a wondrous feeling for its colors, whereas games that have more realistic covers, colors give you a more sense of weight to your choices and your actions. You feel like the things that you do in the game should have more real world repercussion. Line is one of those aspects of cartooniness that you might talk about, but it's a very graphic sort of thing. It helps delineate things from their backgrounds. If you do it in a more realistic game, it's very notable. Um, and if you remove line, 
from a visual that you might say is more stylized, it really emphasizes the mood of a piece, pointing more towards hue and value choices than towards uh, the overall stylization. And then proportion. With funny proportions, you can stylize them to point where a character's head is as big as his body, and that will make things more cheery and funny. But on the other hand, if you have more realistic proportions in an otherwise stylized style, you end up having more immersion into the mood of that character. You think of them as more of an elaborate, fully fleshed human. And then there's light and shadow. Zelda covers a lot of these through its games. You can have absolutely no delineation of light and shadow, or you can have flat light and shadow, or you can have large gradations of light and shadow. Whatever of these elements, color, line, proportion, light and shadow that you use, they can be anything in stylized and realistic. It can be very stylized color with very realistic shadow. You can have line on extremely realistic things, but the most important thing is to be intentional about your choices. Make sure that they all go together and are cohesive. In Pokemon Sun and Moon, the character has a large head and it's about the same size as their torso. And because of the level of stylization throughout the rest of the style, it makes a cohesive piece. But if you have a more realistic game and you have a giant head, it stands out a little bit weird. Now, in Lara Croft's big head mode, they did that intentionally, but if you do it on accident, uh, nobody's gonna take your game seriously. So, that was a lot, but let's talk about some examples. So that example we talked about before, we can pretty quickly tell that it's not a high density environment. So that's not a factor in controlling the focus. There's no frequency of detail that's distracting us from the player. Um, but so we can go to our color things. What in the color spectrum is affecting this? Well, hue, there's a delineation of hue between the character and the background, so that's not the problem. But the real thing is value. If you take away the hues, the saturation, and look at it in grayscale, you can immediately tell that the character doesn't stand out against the background. So it's good to up the values, make the character more of a high contrast focus, and that'll pop out more against the background. Immediately, it's a lot easier to see what's going on and focus on where you want to, where you're on the player. So that's that in value. And if you compare it to the original, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. All right, so in this game, this is the sort of game where you're trying to light up a whole grid of networks. But right now, you can see the lit parts very easily because in the hierarchy of value, they're very bright. They're the only thing that contrasts heavily with the background. But in this sort of game, what matters is not just the lit parts, also the dark parts. It's important to give each piece of information in your games the same level if they matter the same amount. So if we bring the dark parts up in value to match, it's a lot easier to get the information you need because you need both parts of the puzzle to solve it. Before, it was not the same level in the hierarchy and you couldn't focus on the information you needed to solve the puzzle. So here is it before, it's hard to focus on the dark parts that you need that information to solve the puzzle. And now it's a lot easier to balance it. So you can add contrast and hue to solve that problem. All right, so this is the sort of thing that happens when you're like, I want a really bright, colorful game and you're extremely literal about what color is and your saturation is just max. Trees are green, sun is yellow, heroes have red hair, and it's all as bright as possible. Um, so just cool it with your saturation, basically. Uh, you can do things to make your game interesting without just making it as in your face as possible in like an MS paint drawing you made when you were 13 years old. Uh, so if you calm down your saturation, you can make more interesting, less literal color choices. They, tree trunk can be purple, whatever. It's more interesting and less literal and it catches the eye as much, but it's not quite as painful. And if you still wanna go even further, you can be even less literal, stylize your colors even more and do something a little weird and people will find that very memorable, but not painful. Uh, and then, so you can have something that people like at the end of the day. So visual clarity. This can happen when you're trying to reuse assets, especially to minimize the amount of art labor you're doing. Uh, like you get something in the asset store and you just recolor it. You have a green ally and a red enemy, but if you're colorblind, these enemies look basically the same to you. And 
there's ways to work around that. Like value, contrast, works for everybody. If you make adjustments to help with people with visual impairments, it helps everybody delineate things better, not just people who are visually impaired. So other options are to like see, you can immediately tell that it's more different for everyone. Other options are to include symbology, not just in character design uh, or faces, but if you have a particle effect that's red when it's good and green when it's bad, add some sort of symbol like stars or angry X's to delineate symbolically what's good or bad so that everyone can tell what's going on more easily. So you can see that this is easy, much easier to see for everyone whether or not you're colorblind. All right, one of the challenges of 3D lighting is uh, when you put a light in your scene and you uh, realize everything is still too dark, so just keep upping the intensity of the lighting. This is fairly common in people who are getting first into 3D art or making 3D yeah. games. So uh, most engines and 3D renderers have an environmental light or a skybox, which you can increase the lighting and value of so that you have a flat level of light. It makes your shadows less dark. It decreases the overall contrast of your image and lets you do stuff more intentionally instead of accidentally having black value shadows distracting from the art that you're trying to put across. And then once you do that, you can use color and using a warm color can give you more of a narrative experience like candlelight instead of the intense high white that makes you feel like you're in an office. And then you can also use color other ways to just affect the mood, make things feel magical, make things feel silly or spiritual or just fun. So this is it before, and this is it once you try to do lighting more intentionally, instead of just trying to light it enough that everyone can see. And some fancy backgrounds. So you have a game, you put a fancy background in it, and now nobody can stop looking at the background and they're not paying attention to your player anymore. So uh, if it's another thing where there's value contrast problems. There's more value contrast in the background than there is in the player. This is also a density thing. There's a high density background and a low density player, but that's also a type of contrast. A contrast of densities can also be valuable. So that's not the worst part. The worst part is the value contrast being more interesting in the background. So if we drop down the value contrast, make it more of a mid-tone, the player comes out. But it's also good for the player itself to be more high contrast because you want to be able to do a lot of things with your backgrounds. You want them to be able to be diverse. If you make a high contrast player, it can be more intentionally put against a low contrast background and you can have a wide variety of low contrast backgrounds. You can also solve this problem by having a light player against a dark background, but that gives you less options for the diversity of your backgrounds. So you can also do a dark player it's a light background, but that leads you to end up making the same choices in your environment art for the rest of your gameplay. So that's what it was like originally, and this is our revision. You can immediately see that the player is a lot easier to pick out against the content. All right, too cute is a thing that happens a lot in art. People have a lot of opinions about what level of cuteness they want in their games, and there's a lot of elements to cuteness that is kind of vague and confusing. One immediately obvious one about this one is that it's a very saturated green zombie against a spooky background. So if we drop down the saturation, immediately the mood, the style that you're going for comes across more effectively. But there's also the other elements of stylization we talked about, one of which was proportion. Big things, like weird proportions, big heads, big eyes, make things feel a lot more cute very quickly. So if we shake down the head, more creepy. And we can also shrink down the eyes once again. So you have your green guy who's not the creepiest he could be and then you desaturate him, adjust his proportions and he gets a lot creepier very fast. Less cute. All right, so there is a lot going on here and that's pretty typical for game visuals. Like you trying to get a bunch of stuff in, maybe it's not as cohesive as you planned, maybe you didn't make a plan from the beginning, and there's you're kind of overwhelmed. So the thing to do, I think, first is take away the gameplay aspect and focus on your backgrounds. Just like before, this is a very high density background with a lot of value contrast. If we lower the value contrast, you can immediately put more stuff in the foreground that'll pop out more. You can see this with the spider web. 
but the spider web also doesn't need to be a high contrast item. It informs the gameplay and it's an interesting storytelling element, but it's not important to the gameplay. So you can reduce that as well. And now when you put things back on the screen, it's a lot easier to see what's going on and understand what's happening. So now that we've resolved the background problems, let's look at the characters. There's actually a lot of good stuff happening with some of the characters in this. Each of the butterflies has a unique pattern and a unique color. So no matter what uh, color impairment you might have, you can still tell based on the pattern that they're different. And they have hue separation for each player to recognize them as well. Um, but now that we've adjusted the background to more of a medium tone, the spider is a lot harder to see and pick out. So we want to do a value adjustment on that spider so it pops out. Make it darker, you can see uh, it a lot better. And we also made the eyes a different hue. The hue contrast between the spider's eyes and the environment is now greater, so you can pick that out. And in games that are static, uh, where we have static elements, you can also do something like put a light in the background to increase the contrast. It's harder to do in open world games, but if you have a 2D game, it's something that you can use. All right, so if we bring back our bullets, uh, like I said earlier, bullet hells have a sort of inherent density challenge. So we need to do what we can to make it clearer. So these bullets have a delineation strategy that's super common in the memes the kids do, which is you have a white object in a black outline or a dark outline, it's purple in this case. But now that we've changed the values of the image, uh, now we have darker values we don't need a dark value around a white object because the white object is already brightest. And it confuses things like the hitbox and where things would land if you were playing. So it's better to make things bright. You can see where the balance of the bullets are a lot easier and figure out what's going on more easily. And you can have a color association between the bullets that the boss produces and the boss itself. If we go to the player bullets, uh, it's a lot easier to delineate the bullets from each other now already because the yellow is uh, very different from the, what they are looking like. But we'd like to give the player as much information as we can, so why don't we color the bullets to match the player? More information is always good. We want the players to know what's going on. And then uh, we want to delineate the bullets differently between the players and the boss even more. And you can do shape for that, just like I talked about when I talked about colorblindness. But uh, you might want to reserve unique shapes for special weapons or power-ups, so you can just use size to tell the player that a bullet is friendly or an enemy. If it's a small bullet, it's a friendly bullet. And that makes it a lot easier to see what's going on. There's less visual density, there's more open space between things, and you can figure out what's happening a lot more easily. So this is what it looked like before, and this is what it looks like now. So. We talked about critique, how we do it instinctively, and a good way to think about it for actual game development. We talked about color and composition and style and how those affect our game visuals. And we applied it. So hopefully, you can now apply these to your own game visuals. But every game is different. These solutions that I've used are optional solutions. You can use a lot of different strategies with the elements I've talked about to solve gameplay problems and solve like your goals for your games and figure out what suits your game best. Thank you, I'm Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. If you have a question for Ali, please come to the mic in the middle of the aisle there. Um, I will get things started myself. This is, this is awesome stuff and a lot of info. How do you communicate this stuff when you're working with other, you know, within teams, uh, you know, if someone gives you that, it's too blue or something like that, do, do, you, do you give them a whole, you know, half an hour type talk or you just give them a, a, a small piece of this? Well, I'm hoping I can just link them to my talk in the future. Yeah. Uh, but usually you try to ask questions back. So if somebody's like, it's too blue, you just ask, do you mean it's too saturated? Do you mean it, you want it to be a different color? I just try to use the knowledge that you have to ask them and lead them to the correct solution. Any questions? Got one. Hi, thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Um, 
So I definitely paid attention to the owl my eyes slide because I'm working on a very colorful platformer and I probably are gonna hurt some people's eyes. So that was great and think about that. How would you think about styles, very colorful, bright, saturated styles that like Nintendo uses? What kind of um, tools might they use or might think about something like that to, to be able to hit that kind of toy-like fun approach without hurting people's eyes? So the question is how to use bright colors successfully without hurting people's eyes. Well, basically you are more aware of saturation. As vivid as those sorts of games tend to seem, they have various levels of saturation that makes the colors more compatible. You might have a red and a green on the screen together as well, but you won't put them on the same character and that makes it a lot safer. So you use the sort of density uh, and minimal, mi minimalist space separation between elements so that if you have the highest of contrast colors, they're not next to each other. Like uh, Mario is red and blue and Luigi is green and blue, but neither of them are green and red, which are the most hue, uh, hue and color saturation contrast that you could have. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, have you ever dealt with like highly complex machine models? Like how would you, so I work in a company that has very like you know, small team, but we do very complex objects. Mm -hmm. So have you ever had to deal with stuff like say a car, like taking it apart, breaking it down? Like they are very realistic, but how would you kind of manage this? styling in that. Uh, in, in what way? It, it's tough because we have to maintain like product integrity, but then we also have to do artistic. So I didn't know if you guys have ever had to deal with that with like, hey, make this thing look cool, but not too realistic. Sorry, I, I just didn't know that's a vague question. It, it, uh, so you're asking how you can make detailed machine models look stylized in an interesting way? Yeah. Well, it depends on what elements you're allowed to play with based on your thing. Uh, I'm working on a game where I make a lot of weird planes, uh, but they're not anywhere in the realm of realistic. We just do a bunch of strange shapes and play with color palettes to make them stick out in unique ways. Uh, so it depends on which uh, parts of your game or visuals you're allowed to play with. If you can stylize your color, it's always a really fun way to work with stuff and make things more interesting. Okay, I, I actually have, I guess, a more specific question. Have you ever had to deal with um, like conflict with preference over certain color palettes? That's very common. Color palettes are super opinion-based. That's the sort of the thing where you play test it and see where it's effective. Because no matter what situation you're in, there are always people with different opinions and you think about your target audience and what they are most likely to want to see. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, I think that's, that's going to wrap things up. Please make sure you fill out your email surveys to give Ali some feedback on her talk. Uh, thank you so much, Ali.